come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me
Your grace is more, Your grace is found, is where you are. Good morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're happy to be here, say amen. 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 Me too. And what, what do we have outside? Some beautiful September weather. It's just really nice. Anybody have a, enjoy watching some football yesterday? That was pretty nice too. Okay. Uh, this morning we're going to begin our service with a prelude okay, entitled, uh, I Am Thine, O Lord, or commonly known as Draw Me Nearer by Van Rowell. Okay. And it is one of our most favorite, beloved invitation hymns.
Hi, I'm Tom Brown, and I want to bring you this month's Mission Minute. This month, we want to highlight one of our local outreaches called Pregame and Banquet Meals. We've been doing this for about seven years now, and it got started with one school, Central Cabarrus, and grew to us serving all the area high schools. This mission has grown from Friday afternoon meals before a football game to evening banquets for several schools in our area, spanning multiple sports, not just football. Pre-game meals allow us to bring the coaches, players, and sometimes the cheerleaders and serve them a meal, all with the end goal of presenting them with the gospel. The banquets have a slightly different approach since we serve the entire family and they all hear the good news of Christ. Great people have been supporting us from the beginning by signing up to work these outreaches and make this ministry possible. Just recently, the local FCA asked us to support them in some of their events. This happened after the leader attended one of our banquets for Concord High School back in January. In Philippians 2 and 4, Paul tells us not to look to our own interests, but to rather for each of us to look to the interests of others. As a former high school assistant coach, I guarantee you that the meals and fellowship are greatly anticipated and eagerly appreciated by the coaches, cheerleaders, team members, and support staff who attend. I love it because it allows me to be a part of the game I was so deeply involved with for many years. Football and the Christian walk both require sacrifice, devotion, and obedience. That's why these meals are such a wonderful opportunity for our church family to show simple yet meaningful Christian love to others. For many young men, this might be the first time they're served by or interact with a man or woman of faith. We have the opportunity to witness through the simple act of preparing and serving a meal and hearing the pastor share a message of Christ's love for us all. The meals might be hard work and may make for a long afternoon, but oftentimes are the highlight of my week. Who knows, you might look back one day and see an NFL player and say, I served him a meal at FBC. Now on to this month's missions info. First up, Cabarrus County. We are serving Mount Pleasant High School football team a pregame meal on September 24th. See Alex Hamilton or Jeff Bowers for more information or sign up at the information desk in the back. Another local outreach is ABC Preschool. Open house was this past Thursday, and the first day is this coming Wednesday, September 8th. Pray for the teachers and all the kids that are attending. There are 102 kids on roll, the most ever. This is a great way for us to reach local children through education and disciple them at the same time, so pray for this ministry. Speaking of ABC Preschool, this month the Women's Missions Group Project is working on a wish list for ABC Preschool. They are needing a wide range of items. Please check out the full list on the screen and at the front of the collection bins. Gift cards from Hobby Lobby, Dollar Tree, Walmart, Target, Amazon, Oriental Trading. All cleaning supplies, plastic forks and spoons and small plates. All sizes plastic Ziploc bags educational supplies, nut-free perishable snacks, all Nabisco products are peanut-free, outdoor items, bubbles, sidewalk chalk, etc., band-aids, children's prints, and stickers. While our local and regional national trips are complete for 2021, we should have full information for all of our 2022 trips sometime in January. Be on the lookout for info, and we will bring it to you here when it becomes available. Our international trip was to Guatemala, and they returned about a week ago. I'd like Jimmy and Allison to tell you a little bit about that. Good morning. My name is Jimmy Green, and I just returned from my third mission trip to Guatemala, where we worked for a week with Roger and Vicki Grossman at the Good Shepherd Center. For Dr. Vicki, we carried down and delivered a case of over-the-counter medicines requested. For Roger, we delivered a case of tools and small building supplies he requested, and for Dorina, our missionary, we delivered a case of needed supplies. For the Guatemalan children, we delivered several cases of Christmas presents. Everything we delivered was truly a blessing to the missionaries and the children at the Orphanage and Good Shepherd Center, as well as the people that are treated by the doctors there at the center. Thanks to all that collected and supported the purchase of these items. Corgan and the VBS children's effort to collect the needed money for the medicines for the Christmas gifts donated by the women's ministries and to everyone to provide financial support and other items that we delivered. 
Now, on to the work efforts. Even though this time of the year is considered their rainy season, we had very little rain during the working hours, having only some late evening and overnight rain. This definitely was a blessing from God, as we were not affected by the weather as we completed our work. We started each day with a good breakfast, a devotional lesson, and a prayer, and then we headed up the hill to our work site, the future home uh, for a family and a number of Guatemalan or orphans. This is the second home being built. The first home has been finished and is currently occupied with eight orphans and their caretakers. We had a range of work assignments, in including installing ceiling boards, installing wall boards in a loft area, and strengthening the loft area with additional support structure. A number of rooms were painted with a sealer on the adobe block walls, as well as painted bricks, ceiling boards, and windows, shutters, and other various types of things. We also painted bricks, ceiling boards, and windows, shutters with various types of paint and varnishes. We sawed, sculpted, and sanded and shaped posts that will be eventually used for future home structures placed around the home. All in all, it was a very busy week. We came back to the Good Shepherd Center each afternoon, tired and hungry. So after dinner, it wouldn't be long until we were making our way to the showers and then heading on to our bedrooms for what seemed to be a very short night of sleep. Morning seemed to always come quickly. Even all the work, hard work facing us each day, it was an enjoyable time and a great pleasure to work side by side with my brothers and sisters as we accomplished the work. While supporting these last three mission trips, I have always come home feeling more blessed and thankful for what the Lord is doing in my life, thankful for him giving me time and the ability to be his hands and feet in Guatemala. We want to thank everyone for the financial support and the prayers lifted up to the Lord, asking him to keep us safe and healthy during this mission. My name is Allison Whiteman, and this was my first mission trip out of the United States. I had been praying about going on one of these mission trips for a couple of years. I did struggle with some anxiety, but knew that if God wanted me to go, then I would go. My passport had expired. It was looking as if it would not be back in time. But one night during vacation Bible school, midweek, I believe, I walked in and met Robin in the hallway, and then Jill walked up as well. They both had asked if I'd heard anything about the passport, and I said no, and that we needed to keep praying about it. Robin said, well, let's bring it in. Let's pray right now. So we circled up right there in the hallway and prayed that if it was God's will for me to go on this mission trip uh, to Guatemala, that the passport would arrive quickly. So when I got home that night after VBS, I checked the mailbox and there was a package with my passport. I excitedly opened the package and took a picture of my new passport and sent it to Robin and Jill. They both said, well... Guess you're headed to Guatemala. I also saw God move in my workload uh, before departing. He definitely parted the waters for me to be able to step away for a week and focus on the mission field. It was the first time in about six years that I completely disengaged or almost disengaged for at least three days straight, and it was truly a blessing. If you've ever felt called to go on a mission trip, whether it's out of the country, somewhere in the United States, or even in our own community, I would encourage you to have faith and go. I think Jimmy wants me to talk to you a little bit about the COVID test because the medical staff member uh, that was administering them was very, very thorough. It was a very intense swabbing for sure. We were all thankful to have negative tests to carry with us on our journey home. Jimmy did a great job talking about what our jobs were and the projects we were able to complete. I will say that up until about a week before we left, I thought we would be working in the main children's home. We did not do that this year because of COVID. When I realized I would be doing construction, I was a little nervous. Um, it was great to have veterans on the trip. I was the only member of the team that had not been to Guatemala before. Jill was a great boss, or as we called her in Spanish, La Jefe. Uh, Linda, Jill, and I worked together many of the days, sealing adobe bricks with six coats of sealer, painting varnish on bricks high and low, and painting shutters and window trim. One of my favorite things was seeing the children when they got home from school. They would always greet us with a smile and practice their English. We would also practice our Spanish. I was amazed at all they were doing, going to school, some were learning to play musical instruments, 
helping to cook their meals, and also just having fun together. Roger and Vicki are providing so much for these children. They're teaching them firsthand the love of the Lord and providing them with a solid education and health care. The love uh, Roger and Vicki have for the children, the center, and the rest of uh, their work in Guatemala is so evident. They are going on their 33rd year in Guatemala as missionaries. Praise the Lord. They are still on fire for the Lord and the work they are doing there. I will feel forever blessed and grateful that I had this opportunity to serve with the FBC Concord team and see firsthand what God is doing through Baptist on Missions. Thanks, Jimmy and Allison, and to everyone that worked, went, gave money or time and made this year's mission trips possible. Every missionary that went this year was given money from our Mission First offering. This offering is multifaceted and goes to so many things, not the least of which is sending short-term missionaries to the mission field. Now get out of your seat and go and be his hands and feet. Well, good morning, church family. First of all, thank you to our missions committee. Thank you to our Guala mission team. But I want to just highlight for you something you noticed. The first of the month, we always have these mission videos. And as a staff, we have established that every month we're going to have the first month dedicated to celebrate what God is doing here through missions for His glory. Now, you might ask the question, why? Why show these videos? Why share what God is doing? Well, during my last class in seminary, we had to read a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. And John Piper writes this quote, and I want to share it as sort of a motivation for us this morning. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. And missions exist because worship doesn't. Think about that for a moment. We share these videos not so that we can celebrate how awesome and incredible First Baptist Church is. This is not sort of a pat on your back moment for us. What we are doing right now in showing these videos is reminding ourselves that in Guatemala, in our own city, there are people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as a church get an opportunity to share and witness and pour out the good news unto them. And therefore we exist for that purpose. So this morning, let me encourage you. We are not here to celebrate a group or a mission team or all the efforts we do. And I'm thankful for all of them. I'm thankful for these videos. But we are here to celebrate the Lord of all the nations. The Lord of Guatemala, the Lord of Alaska, the Lord of Concord. We are here to worship and glorify Him this morning. Amen? Amen. And therefore, I want to read Revelation chapter 15 to remind us that He is the Lord of all the nations. Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, and all nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed." Church, this morning we serve a great God. Amen? Amen. And therefore, with that joy, let us all stand and declare how great thou art this morning. Howard, would you lead us?
Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that we can be on mission for you. Lord, we are thankful that you have given us the task of making disciples. But Lord, always remind us by your Spirit that we do all these things for the purpose of furthering your name among the nations. For Lord, there is none like you. You are great and worthy to be praised. And therefore, this morning, Lord, I pray in all of the activities we participate, through giving, through serving, through hearing your word, through singing, let all these things be for the purpose to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to provide a few announcements this morning, but as I'm providing announcements, we are also handing out deacon nomination ballots this morning. If you did not receive a deacon nomination slip, raise your hand as I'm doing announcements, and one of our ushers will make sure to get that ballot to you this morning. Church family, do know we have Wednesday night activities coming back this Wednesday. Supper will be at 5.45 p.m., followed by adult Bible study, RAs, GAs, mission friends, and youth. All of it starting back this upcoming Wednesday. September 8th, and we'll be starting in the fellowship hall at 5.45 for supper. So make sure you note that. Men, make sure to mark your calendar for next Sunday. We have our men on mission breakfast coming up at 7.45 a.m. next Sunday in the fellowship hall. So men, and this is for men of all ages. So this is for our children, our students, our young adults, our senior adults, all of our men. Make sure to join us next Sunday for Mental Mission Breakfast, September 12th, 7.45. Note, also next Sunday, we begin our Sunday night activities. We have a brand new Bible study for youth in 1 Peter. Ms. Corgan is teaching on the fruit of the Spirit next Sunday night from 5 to 6 p.m. And also, Pastor Jim and Myra Collier are teaching in the multipurpose room for Seeking Him from 5 to 6 p.m. So all that starts next week. I'll be sending out just information and reminders this week. But ladies, here's the big announcement for our ladies. Um, rewoven is having their first meeting at High Rock Lake coming up this Saturday, September 11th. If you are attending, you need to let know Ms. Claudette or Ms. Jessica Andrews, uh, Ms. Melissa Wright, as soon as possible. Ms. Claudette, Ms. Uh, Jessica, would you raise your hand real quick? Ladies, you see these two ladies? If you are coming to Rewove, and make sure to contact them as soon as possible. It's going to be a great time of fellowship and the Word together. To our guests, thank you for so much for joining us in worship this morning. It truly is an honor that you have joined us here, and we are thankful that you have joined us to be in our presence and worship the Lord together this morning. And to show our love and greeting unto you this morning, we want to greet one another this morning. And therefore, I encourage everyone to please stand up and to take the next few moments to greet those around you this morning in the name of the Lord.
Awesome, awesome. Church, in celebrating our Lord this morning, let us sing this is amazing grace.
Take pink today. How's school going? Are y'all excited to have the day off tomorrow? Yeah? Is anybody else here today? I think maybe a lot of people are out of town. Yeah? All right, can anybody tell me what a disciple is? Hey, Nick. You want to tell us what a disciple is? I know you know it's probably just hard to explain, yeah? Okay. So just because somebody comes to church or just because somebody reads their Bible or does good things, does that make them a disciple? No. A disciple of Jesus is someone who has repented or turned away from their sin and who believes that Jesus died on the cross. If you're following Jesus, then that would make you a disciple as well. Do you think you can follow the world and Jesus at the same time? I know that's a tough question. Charlie's like, no. (laughs) All right, so they're complete opposites. If you're following one, your back is to the other. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Everyone in in these verses is following the world, and no one is seeking after God. They've all turned their backs and gone astray. In order to follow God, we have to turn our back to the world. It's one or the other. There's no middle. That's what the word repent means, turning away from our sin and from the world and turning to Jesus. There's a few verses in Matthew that talk about disciples are those who follow Jesus when he calls them. A disciple is one who denies himself, takes up his own cross, and follows Jesus. A disciple is someone who repents of their sin and is baptized. And a disciple is one who shows he loves God by obeying. Jesus sends his disciples to tell people about him. 
As Jesus' first disciples were sent out, they were told to make other disciples. As they went, they called out for people to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus. Do y'all remember what game we played in Kingdom Kids to talk about how good news is shared? Played it where we whisper in somebody's ear. We made a circle. Yeah, we played telephone to talk about how you share something with somebody and then they can share the good news. Yeah? Yep. The message that those men preached 2,000 years ago is the same message that everybody needs to hear today and respond to. In order to be a disciple or follower of Jesus, we need to turn away from our own sin and turn to Jesus and follow him. Go be a disciple. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the powerful name of Jesus, we come before you this morning, Lord, thanking you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful report we heard from the mission team that has returned from Guatemala, Lord. We thank you for their impact there locally, Lord, on those children and on Roger and Vicki. Lord, we thank you for the safety and travel you, you've given them, and Lord, for the help you've also afforded them with. And Lord, as we come before you now at this time of this service, Lord, um, the time of offering, I pray, Lord, that you'll... Uh, bless the gift and the giver, Lord. I pray that these these uh, gifts that are received, Lord, you will you will uh, magnify, Lord, and you will multiply them. And uh, Lord, that we'll see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I ask this prayer in your Son's name. Amen. Till my trophies at last I lay down. 
Sophie, thank you. Considering it's Mission Sunday, I want you to think about the last six months. You know, God has graced us with many opportunities here at First Baptist. Mission's first offering, as you heard in the video. Pre-game football meals, which we are starting back now with Mount Pleasant. All the sports banquets, we got a chance to partner with NC BAM back in June. We got a chance to partner in Alaska and recently in Guatemala. Now this might seem like a um, pressing question, but I pray this question will cause us to reflect and think this morning. But was it really worth it? All the miles, all the investment, all the time, was all of it worth it? And then just think about what we've been reading in Acts. The last few weeks we've read about what we call Paul's first missionary journey. Think about all the miles, beaten, stoned, dragged throughout the city. Was it all worth it? Just think for that for a moment. And I know our first response as Christians, and rightly so, is yes, it's worth it. But allow me to give just a little illustration this morning to reaffirm why. It's worth it. Now, we were in Alaska back in July. We went to the Sea Life Center in Seward, Alaska. This was our day off for our missions team. And so me and Trip Beaver and Terry Gilmore and a few other guys, we were up on the top level of the Sea Life Center, and up there were starfish. And I've always find starfish just really, really fascinating. And as I was playing with those starfish, really acting like a five-year-old kid once again, playing and touching and rubbing and being so fascinated. It reminded me of an illustration I want to share from Max Anders. One day, a man and a boy were walking along the beach, and a boy sees this man pick up a starfish from the sand and toss it back into the sea. The boy said, why did you do that, mister? The man replied, well, the tide is going out, and the starfish would be stranded here and dry out, and in all likelihood, he would be long dead before the tide comes in again. What difference could it make? Surely, the boy says, there are thousands and thousands of starfish in the ocean. What difference does it make if you just take one and you throw it back in the ocean? It makes a great deal of difference to this one. He smiled. He walked down the beach, more than likely to find another starfish and throw it back in. Think about church. What difference does it make to share the gospel to students and coaches and cheerleaders through our football pregame meals? What difference does it make? Think about our Alaska team. What difference did it really make that we went out there and played soccer with 15, 20, 25 kids and get a chance to share the gospel with these children? And really, even for us in Alaska, we had a really unique experience where on Thursday, when we were conducting our camp for basketball, there were three children present. What difference does it make to minister to three children in the middle of Alaska? What difference does it make to support Roger and Vicki Grossman? What difference does it make to bring medical supplies and to work down there and support them through construction? Just think about this. What difference does any of this make? Well, church, I want to encourage you. My heart this morning is more in a mood of encouragement, and my encouragement to you is this. All these things that we are doing for the glory of Christ, they make a difference. They matter. They're making a kingdom impact. 
And so this morning as I've been given the task to really finish up the end of chapter 14, it's quite short. And the text is really simple and plain, and I thought, well, I could either really extend this sermon out and keep you to 2 o'clock, which I'm not going to do. That would be more discouragement than encouragement. You get the idea. However, what I want to do this morning is to encourage you about the process of discipleship. Here at First Baptist, it is our purpose, it is our calling. God has created us and saved us to make disciples. And this morning, I want to sort of just highlight through the last two chapters we've been studying in the book of Acts. I want to look at this first missionary journey for just a few brief moments. And truly, I'm being honest, just a few brief moments and really think about the process of making disciples. That is my purpose and goal this morning. Therefore, if you have God's Word, please stand with me and turn to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, and this is going to be verses 21 through 28 as we talk about this morning the process of discipleship. Beginning in verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed." Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how He had opened doors of faith to the Gentiles." And they remain no little time with the disciples. Church, let us pray. Lord, we are thankful here that you have equipped us and empowered us and provided for us the opportunity to make disciples. And so, Lord, I pray that these words this morning would be an encouragement to your people, a reminder of the call upon our lives And that truly, Lord, we would be disciple makers. Wherever you may send us, wherever you have planted us, Lord, let us be disciple makers. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to give you the outline up front. And these six words don't encompass all about discipleship, but really is the core of the process of making disciples. Calling, praying, witnessing, teaching, leading, reporting. Those are the six I'm going to go this morning. And really, you've already experienced one of those process this morning through our video reporting about what God is doing in Guatemala and through missions here at First Baptist. But let's begin with the idea of calling. If you turn just a few pages back to Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, you remember that as the church in Antioch is preparing to send forth Paul and Barnabas, you remember this passage beginning in verse 1 and verse 2. And I'll pick up in verse 2. While they are worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I have called them. Now, It's a very simple text, and we see here the initial calling of Paul and Barnabas. But let me encourage you, church, God is still calling men and women to ministry right now. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that God is still calling pastors and missionaries and teachers, that God is still working? And sometimes I think we're really discouraged, and I want to encourage you in this way, we're really discouraged that think that calling stops at a certain age. For you see, when you go to seminary, 
If you go to Southeastern or Southwestern or Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, most of the students on campus are going to be in their 20s. And you would naturally assume, well, you either listen to God's call when you're 23 or 24 or 25, and if you miss it, you just miss your calling. But you know what's interesting is I had a little bit different experience at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. I attended Gordon-Conwell here in Charlotte, and we had an adult education model. And within our model of seminary, what was really neat and interesting about my interactions was I had seminary classes with individuals who were my dad's age, 50, 60, 70 years old. I had people in my class who were men and women and from all different nationalities, and it reminded me that it's never too late to respond to the call of God upon your life. And to remember that even in this church, even among our membership, just like the Church of God in Antioch, I truly believe God is calling men and women from this church. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a student. Maybe it's an adult. I believe God is calling people from this church to go into vocational ministry. But also, I do want to encourage you in this way. God calls each of you to be a disciple maker. Every single one of us. If you are a parent in this room, your greatest responsibility as a parent is first and foremost to be a disciple maker of your children. You ask the question, where's my mission field as a parent? Parents, it sits right before you. You have the opportunity to disciple your children. But think about all of our vocations that are represented in this room. We have teachers, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have nurses, we have all these different fields that are represented here. You have the opportunity where God's planted you to be a disciple maker, to witness, to share the good news of Jesus, but also to follow up with teaching and to encourage them to be a part of a local church. All of us in here are disciple makers. I think sometimes we have this um, unhealthy picture that the disciple maker is only the pastor. And that's a very unhealthy view. For I want to encourage you and truly empower you and encourage you by the Spirit of God, you are called as a believer in Christ to make disciples wherever God has planted you. You as a believer, hear me, you have a purpose. You have a purpose and a calling to make disciples. But I want you to know something real quick. If you look at Acts 13, notice their posture, the posture of this church. They were worshiping the Lord, and they were fasting. Let me just ask you this question. When is the last time that you have prayed or fasted for God to call someone from this church into ministry? Now, we can only answer that as individuals, but think about this. When's the last time we really took time to pray and to fast? And particularly here in this context, this is the church of Antioch. This is the corporate body praying and fasting for God's spirit to move and to call Paul and Barnabas to go out into the mission field. Churches, I'm going about to speak to here in just a second. We are called to dedicate ourselves to prayer and fasting and a posture of dependence upon the Lord because ultimately He's the one that calls. Going into ministry is not about talent. I think sometimes we have been deceived to think that ministry is all about who's the most gifted, the most talented, the most good looking. And sometimes we get this perception by, let's be honest, TV preachers. Because sometimes you look on television and you think, man, they're so talented. Look at their charisma. Look at their built shoulders. Look at that face. They look so good up there speaking. But the reality is, God is about calling those who are willing to serve and to give their life for the sake of the gospel. And church, let me encourage all of us, let us have a posture of prayer and fasting and asking God to call those among us to go and serve on the ministry field, but also let us pray for ourselves 
to be on mission as disciple makers in our community. Number two, I want to highlight prayer. Then after fasting and prayer, they lay their hands on them and sent them out. If you look through the book of Acts, this is just a, I was reading through Acts this week just trying to count how many times prayer is mentioned within the context of the early church. Fifty-one times in this letter alone is prayer mentioned. Now, why is that important? As Baptists, and I'm thankful for being a Baptist. I really am. I'm thankful for the heritage of being a Baptist. But notice here, as Baptists, we pride ourselves in being very pragmatic. Okay? We are a very practical people. We are known for our great strategies. Think about that. There are a lot of different, different organizations and denominations that envy the North American Mission Board and the International Mission Board and envy how we plan and mobilize and go and serve. Think about this right now. We just have these hurricanes and these natural disasters. We had Hurricane Ida. We also had recently the earthquake in Haiti. Baptists, by God's grace, are some of the first people on the ground who have planned, who have mobilized, and are ready to go serve. And I celebrate the Lord for that. That's awesome that we are so pragmatic that we can go and be a part of that. But let me encourage you as a church, all of our efforts, if they're not bathed in prayer, and if we attempt to do all of these efforts in our own strength, we will absolutely fail. We as a church, to encourage all of us, we as a church are called to be a people of prayer. That's the only way we can make disciples. If you ask us the question, why are we dedicating Wednesday nights to having a time of prayer? Why do we have the prayer communicator? And we're praying about all these different ministries and opportunities and people groups. Why are we videotaping these times of prayer with Pastor Jim and myself? Why? Because the only way we can be disciple makers is by being a people that is dependent upon the Lord through prayer. If we try this just simply because we're smart and we have strategies and we can mobilize and we have the resources, if it's just solely about our strength, we will fail every single time. But if we depend upon the Lord, I encourage you, the discipleship can take place. And so I, that's just the note here, because I know as a church, we have all these things that are listed this morning on the missions um, video. And you see all these things that we're doing, and you think, man, First Baptist is about serving and mobilizing and doing. And that's awesome. I'm thankful that we're on the ground being the hands and feet of Jesus. But we can't be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community or Guatemala or Alaska or Thomasville or wherever God may send us. We can't be the hands and feet of Jesus unless we truly are depending upon him to give us strength by his spirit and to empower us to give us courage and boldness and confidence in the gospel in order to go serve. And so church, as we think about ministry this fall, let us go forth in ministry, bathing all of these things in prayer. Third, witnessing. If you notice in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18, that is the instance in where Paul begins to witness to the city. Now, note something about the gospel. If you ever read through the Acts of the Apostles, something's going to stand out to you. Notice the type of people that Paul and Peter and John witnessed to. The gospel is extremely inclusive. Okay? Think about this, okay? Think about all the different people, Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, the physically handicapped, pagan mountain people, a prominent merchant woman, a jailer, a family, Greek philosophers, governors, kings. The gospel is for all people. That is something that is convictional about us in our witnessing efforts. And I, I want to encourage you because I think our ministry reflects this. But hear me, church, we share the gospel 
to all people. That's why we go to Guatemala. That's where we go to different people groups. We go to Alaska. The reason why we go is the gospel is bigger than Concord. The gospel is bigger than North America. The good news of Jesus and witnessing and telling others about the good news goes beyond these four walls and goes to every single people group across this world. And to think that we could be a part of that witness to this whole world. And what's great is that the first witnesses are written down right here. I mean, the first witnesses are Peter and John and Paul. And you ask, well, what is a witness? Well, 1 John describes John's account of what it meant to be a witness of Jesus. I want to read this to you. If you've never read 1 John before, please read 1 John. Absolutely beautiful, God-inspired, Spirit-inspired word. But hear the first beginning words. That which was from the beginning which we have heard and which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and we testify to it to proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We have recorded in the Scriptures, the trustworthy Scriptures, the witnesses who saw, who heard, who touched Christ, who saw His death and resurrection and ascension. They are the first witnesses. But every subsequent generation of Christians... We are called to be the next generation of witnesses to the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why, if you notice, every ministry that we do, including our football mills, the banquets, Alaska, all these opportunities, we take time to be witnesses. We share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now... I love different benevolent ministries. I love different humanitarian ministries. But hear me about this. Um, If someone has enough food and enough skill, they can feed a football team. Think about that. If they have enough skill and enough food, they can take care of a sports team or a banquet. Any soccer player with the basic knowledge of the game can put on a clinic for children. And think about Vacation Bible School. I mean, any amusement company can come out and bring out water slides and have a great time of fun. Okay? All these things that we do, whether it be giving or serving, they're all great. But understand, our core purpose of Vacation Bible School of the football mills, of Alaska, wherever God sends us, our core purpose is to be a witness, is to tell others about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why when we do our ministries, when we do our football mill, we are not ashamed about why we are doing the football mill. Yes, we want to love you. We want to serve the team. We want to pour into them. But most importantly, we want to get the opportunity to share the truth that Jesus Christ died for them. And that's what it means to be a witness. Number four, teaching. Notice here as Paul is about to leave, he says he strengthens the souls. Verse 22 of Acts 14. He's strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, I want to make note here, tribulation is normal. Going through difficult times is a normal thing for the Christian. I know sometimes in North America we could be lulled to sleep to think that truly tribulations and trials are for other countries and not for our own. But realize this. If you are a Christian, you will face a difficult time in your life. And so if you ask the question, why do we have so many teaching ministries? 
Okay, think about all the ministry this fall. We have Old Testament survey. We're teaching with our senior adults through Young Hearts. Ms. Corgan is teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. We have RAs and GAs and mission friends. We have all of our women's Bible studies. We have the Sunday school. We have Bible studies for our students. Why are we doing all these Bible studies? Think about it. Why are we doing all of this teaching in the church? Well, yes, I'm thankful for the knowledge. I'm thankful for the growth in character as a Christian. But I believe the reason why we teach is because every single Christian, from child to senior adult, you will be tested in your faith. In this life, you will face difficult times. You will face doubt. Sometimes you will want to run and quit. You think, I've never had that experience before? Believe me, one day you will be tested, and you'll ask the question such as, why God? Why is this happening to me? Sometimes you just want to throw in the towel. And to be quite honest, we know there's Satan. He's trying to deceive us. He's trying to deceive us to believe false things, to walk away from the faith. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, we are lulled to sleep because of the context in which we live in North America. I was going to share a video, but it's probably not proper in this context, but I'm going to refer to you this video to go watch later on at home. Now, this is a sarcastic video done by a Christian comedian named John Christ. This video is called Millennial Missionaries, okay? You can write this down, the Millennial Missionaries. And hear me up front, it's sarcasm, okay? It's not real. <laughs> but there's something striking in that video where it shows two young millennial, really a couple, going to Aruba and going to Tuscany and calling it a missions trip. <laughs> and it might sound funny, and it is somewhat comical, but if we're not careful, we almost believe that this life in North America as a Christian is going to be at least relatively easy, and then one day we pass and we go see the Lord in glory. But the reality is this. If we're going to be witnesses and we're going to be disciple makers and we're teaching others, we are equipping for the purpose and the reality that one day our faith will be tested. If you live long enough on this earth, your faith will be tested. Number five, leading. Notice verse 23. And when they appointed elders from every church with prayer and fasting, they commissioned them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Constantly we see when the apostles start a church, they also establish leadership. They always establish elders. This was a part of even their earliest church, and we know that. Because read the book of James. The letter of James is one of the earliest letters we have in our can of Scripture. And in James chapter 5, it mentions the word elder. So even the first congregations, 10 to 15, 20 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, there's already leadership established in the church. But let me just encourage you in this way. I've been blessed with a great leader and mentor and Pastor Jim. And I am thankful that I can lead alongside and support the ministry that God has called him here to. But I want to also warn you in this way. Leading is not about a personality contest. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we will naturally attract to people in their leadership solely because of their charisma how talented, how gifted, how good-looking they are. Church, let me just give you a word of caution. Leadership comes at a high cost. And even James chapter 3, if you follow me on Facebook, I pointed out this week, if you are called to be a leader and called to teach, you also be judged with a stricter judgment than others. And so I want to encourage you, church family, to pray for our leadership because God is still raising up leaders from among the churches just like here. But I want to encourage you, pray for the leadership of this church. 
Because we are trying, by God's grace and by the Spirit of God, we are trying to lead you to go forth and equip you to make disciples. That's the reason why we teach. That's the reason why we have fellowship. That's the reason why we provide these opportunities. We do all of these things in order to lead in making disciples. But I'm also asking you as an associate pastor, this cannot be about my strength or a pastor's strength or my personality or a pastor's personality. It can't be about any of that. All of this is about glorifying Christ, not a man. And we have to protect our hearts. And the way we protect our hearts is we bathe these things in prayer. So church, I'm just encouraging you as a leader, God has graced us with leadership, and I'm thankful for that. But never elevate us to an unhealthy status. Guard yourselves in that way. We're called to lead, but understand we also face the same struggles and the same temptations and the same fears and the same doubts and the same anxieties you wrestle with. And God has prepared us and put us in this position of leadership. But church, we do this together. This is not a one-man show. Ministry and making disciples requires more than one person. It requires a team. It requires this church to go forth and do the mission of our Lord. And then last is reporting. When they arrived together, verse 27 of chapter 14, when they arrived together and gathered church, they declared all the things that God had done with them and how he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles and there remained no little time with the disciples. You know, we are truly modeling this morning what the early church did in Acts. We provide a report. We shared with the body of Christ what God is doing in and through his people to further his name among the nations. I truly believe that reporting is actually important. It encourages the people of God. It encourages you, all of you, that you are a part of what God is doing. See, you may not have been going to uh, Guatemala. Think about this. There's only seven on that mission team. And you think, well, how am I a part of what God's doing in Guatemala? You pray. You give. You gave medical supplies. You sacrifice time and support them in other ways. You are a part of what God is doing in the world. And think about through our mission's first offering. I mean, God has graced and blessed and provided for this church that literally we have sent out over $100,000 toward mission efforts this year. In a pandemic year, we could be on mission. And that's why we give you these reports. I know it's easy to be discouraged. You're asking, what's the future of the church? Is God still working? Is God still moving? What's God doing around the world? Let me encourage you, church. God's not done. God's in control. God is still saving. God is still working. He is moving. And we are seeing disciples be made. And that's why we report, is to encourage the body of Christ and ultimately to turn and worship him. For that is why we exist. We exist to worship our Lord. So here's, I'm going to close it this morning. And you're thinking Aaron's closing already? Well, it's a miracle. God works in mysterious ways. But let me just give you a few words of encouragement this morning. And I want to end it with just a truly a simple prayer. And then I'm going to ask Howard to come up and lead us in the benediction after I pray. Church, we have the great privilege to be disciple makers. There is a calling for each and every one of us in the context that God has given us to be disciple makers. But hear me, you can't do it in your own strength. You must bathe these opportunities in prayer. For without God's spirit, without God's strength, we cannot make disciples. But realize, being a disciple maker means more than just benevolence. Yes, be kind, show love, serve others. That's awesome. But make sure you share the gospel. Make sure you share the truth of the good news that Jesus Christ lived the perfect life, died a sacrificial death, and he's not dead. 
He is alive and he is on his throne. Share that good news with others. But as you share, also teach. Parents, I want to encourage you. You have the most time with your children to teach the scriptures. And I'm thankful for our Sunday school teachers. I'm thankful for all the opportunities we offer here for teaching. But teach in your context. Have family devotions. Have time together in the word and truly teach God's word together. But let me encourage you in this way. Understand that everything he is doing, all the teaching that we're seeing, he's preparing us. Because I truly believe that, yes, there is more pressure and pressure and pressure building upon us. And our first reaction is, man, this is discouraging. I can't believe this is happening in my lifetime. I can't believe all these things are taking place. Well, church, be encouraged. I'm giving you this report to let you know that despite everything you see, God's in control He's still working. He's still using us. And church, be encouraged that God is still on the move. So here's how you can pray today. Number one, pray that God would truly use you to be a disciple maker wherever he's placed you. Pray for this church that truly we would be a people characterized by making disciples. That's our first. Second, if you want to be a part of a church, that its goal and purpose is to make disciples. I encourage you, contact Pastor Jim this week. Go to our website, send him an email, and truly tell him that if you want to be part of a church that makes disciples, listen, we're not perfect by no means, but we do know our purpose. And if you want to be part of a church that truly is about the purpose of making disciples, contact Pastor Jim this week. But last, and certainly not least, the most important thing is this. You can't be a disciple of Christ unless you know him. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never confessed your sin, repented of your sin, turned away from your sin, and put your faith alone for salvation in Christ, there's no hope outside of that. So my encouragement to you today is truly take this day to turn to Christ in faith. And if you have questions, if you have concerns, I encourage you, grab someone, but also after service, grab me. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to take some time and share the good news that Jesus truly came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He went to that cross. He died for you and for me in our place. But no, he's not in the grave. He is alive, he's on his throne, and he's working, and he's moving. In church, we have joy this morning because he is still working and moving. So let us pray with those three things in mind. And I would encourage you that after I pray, and Howard leads us in the benediction, if you received your deacon ballots, nomination this morning, make sure to hand that to the usher as you head out the door this morning. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this time of worship. Lord, thank you that we can be disciple makers. Lord, we're thankful that you have called us, that you've equipped us, that your spirit resides in us to do the work of the ministry. And so, Lord, I pray that we would bathe all of our efforts in prayer. For, Lord, we need you. We need you in every single ministry and every single opportunity you give us. And, Lord, at the forefront, we just say thank you. Thank you for providing and opening these doors for us to do ministry. And Lord, let us be faithful in making disciples. So Lord, to worship and thank you. Lord, thank you for how you're using your people here. Thank you, Lord, for how you're equipping us. And Lord, I pray in a world that is filled with anxiety and discouragement and fear, bring joy and strength and hope to your people this day and remind them, that you are still working and that you are alive and well and reigning and that you will one day soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all please stand? Howard, would you lead us in the benediction, please?